It is a distinct honor for the Associated Student Speakers Program to have as our guest today, Mr. Vance Packard. Mr. Packard is a leading author in the field of sociology. Three of his books, The Status Seekers, The Hidden Persuaders, and The Waste Makers, have made the nation's best top sellers list. Following today's presentation, there will be an informal discussion and coffee hour in the Chancellor's Executive Room in Student Union 2408. That room is right outside the entrance, uh, right outside the Grand Ballroom. Also, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome students from El Rancho High School who are also here with us today. <coughs> the title of Mr. Packard's speech today is What is Happening in America? And at this time, it gives me a great pleasure and honor to present to you Mr. Vance Packard. Thank you. Thank you. See you. See you. <laughs> Uh, excuse me. I shouldn't be re disrespectful of the senator. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Howard, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted by the honor of being invited back to your distinguished forum. I am frankly quite astonished after the events of last Saturday that anyone here is present at all. I just came <coughs> from the stricken city of New York where citizens deprived of mass rapid transit are struggling to learn how a new form of survival. This is a form of survival that the citizens of another vast metropolitan area, Los Angeles, have been stubbornly practicing for many years. Most of you, 95% of you, I would guess, are going to be living a part of your life in the 21st century. And I imagine that quite a few of you are starting to wonder what kind of world you are going to inherit and what the life will be like in the coming decades and possibly some of the thoughts I can offer here today may stimulate your thinking. Because I think if, if we're realistic, we must face the fact that there are a number of underlying forces that are subtly sh reshaping our whole style of life, and our economy. We are seeing the most dramatic, the most drastic change in our way of life that has occurred in our history, I believe. As a matter of fact, societies all around the planet are experiencing a change so rapidly, so rapid that it amounts to a convulsion. Americans have always been a people who have changed faster than most other societies, and we have had other periods of intense change, such as around 1800 and around 1870 and around 1920. But today the rate of change itself is accelerating and will continue to. I think that there are many forces at work today, but I think the most tremendous force in terms of changing our whole way of life for the coming decades is focused on the matter of are exploding technology. Last summer I had the opportunity to read the galleys on a remarkable book that has just recently come out <coughs> by the Yale psychologist Kenneth Keniston called The Uncommitted. It's about trying to understand the restlessness and alienation of younger people today. And he makes one remarkable statement, or he makes a number of remarkable statements, but one that particularly caught my attention, he said that central to the American society is the unquestioned primacy in virtually every area of our collective existence of technology. He said technology provides the motor for the continual social change to which we must all somehow adapt. I believe that the technological revolution 
It is producing a host of other changes. It is serving as a sort of chain, producing a chain, chain reaction that is reaching deep within the fabric of our society and it's changing our environment, our economic thinking, and our values. Some of the changes that are influenced to a considerable extent by the exploding technology, for example, and by science, scientific explosion, are first of all the outpouring of goods at an ever faster rate, also the changing role of the female in our society, it's even getting that far, uh, because of Technology has changed the world of work. Work is no longer a dirty, dangerous world. And also it's changing the environment of the home and it's changing the relationship between the male and female uh, in many substantial ways. Technology is creating an explosion of our population or it's contributing to this explosion. And more particularly in the large metropolitan areas, it is creating vast congestions of people, and the forms of our great metropolitan areas are being shaped to a large extent by the requirements of the automobile. We're seeing a great growth in giant organizations to accommodate to this new technology. We're seeing a great change in the methods of fighting wars in this new technology and the economic impact of wars. We're seeing enormous growth in the abundance of leisure so that we have more time to go to the racetracks and to Las Vegas and travel abroad and also more time to worry about what the implications may be of having too much leisure in coming years. And we are seeing as a result of the exploding technology a need for a highly mobile population to make technology work. Last year I came into the Los Angeles airport and had to get to Fresno and uh, the planes were down and a, two men offered me a ride in their car they had rented and it turned out they were going to Fresno as as, as uh, because they worked for, for a glass company in Corning, New York and there was something wrong with the plant here in Fresno and they were troubleshooters that come out to fix it up. We're seeing also as a result of exploding technology a demand for education to manage all these changes that are taking place and at the same time, at periods when we are worried about unemployment, we're seeing a large number of uh, Americans thinking of higher education as a way of keeping younger people off the labor force. We're also seeing, as a result of technology, I believe, pressures for a hedonistic society, living for the moment, living it up, and happy to live against the future. I'd like here briefly this noon to explore with you a few of the, in more detail, of what I consider to be the great trends of our day that will be affecting the life of all of you. And perhaps most obviously is the continuing growth of our productive capacity which is now up to about 3.5% a year and is the wonder of the world and apparently is going to continue to mount with automation and all the rest. We have created a capacity to turn out a fantastic amount of goods and the question increasingly in our society is how to absorb all that can be produced. We're seeing evidences of personal wealth on every side we still have our ill-fed, our ill-clothed. These are primarily people who belong to special groups, the aged, the infirm, the illiterate, the migratory workers, minority people, or people who have been left behind by migrating industry or changing technology. But for the average working man who has a job, he has little sense of being poor in the old kind of sense that I knew as a boy when the United States cabinet seriously deliberated on, the, deliberated on the possibility of starting a nationwide campaign to collect table scraps to distribute from central depots to the poor. Now, there are a couple, I, I should say that 
Economists from Adam Smith on have argued that the main purpose of any economic system is to provide more goods for the average citizen, but we are getting to the point of being able to turn out goods that raises questions that deserve require our scrutiny because we are being urged many times to consume simply to meet the needs of the productive process. And a couple of these as a couple of aspects of this productivity especially deserve our attention. One is that more and more of the outpouring is in the area of optional goods that we can take or leave. The the frills, the necessities, the niceties of life. And this is good and we enjoy them but it also makes us more vulnerable to the fact that 50% of all the things produced in this country today are things that are not necessities of life. If we ever did have a depression and people started tightening their belts, there would be a vulnerability because we have this great explosion in buying of power boats and life-size dolls that can speak six languages. And we spend $125 million a year on face cream and we spend nearly a half billion dollars on dog food, more on dog food than we do on baby food. And interestingly, the explosion or the growth in the dog food uh, <coughs> sales is not in so much in the actual food for the dog, but in the snacks you toss the dog in between meals. And As an example of this new kind of Alice in Wonderland economy of ours, I got on an air, a jet airplane in Boston a few weeks ago, and I was sitting down to enjoy my newspaper, and I heard strange noises underneath me, and uh, it sounded it's, 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 it was crazy. It sounded like dogs, and and, uh, and so I, I I called the stewardess and asked what what was going on, and and she said the whole bottom of the airplane was was filled with greyhound dogs, being shipped from the racetracks of Massachusetts to the racetracks of Florida. Uh, and this is a, a, a part of our new economy, a growing dependence upon dogs and upon gambling. More seriously, as an impact of this outpouring capacity to produce goods is the fact that we have been in recent years considerably concerned in our society about the possibility of absorbing all that can be produced. We have the marvelous case of the Alberto Culver people bringing out a new shampoo, I think last year, and they had finished making the TV commercials for the shampoo, its name Subdue, before the chemists had completed formulating the formula. Uh, this was simply putting first things first. And certainly before our economic environment was changed by the Vietnam War, we were, and our economists were considerably concerned about the growing unused productive capacity of our factories. Around 80, around 20% of our factories were not, uh, around 20% of their capacity was not being used. And we were seeing a great growth in the unused utilization of many of our retail outlets such as gas stations and I think this perhaps is still going on in the small town of Emporia, Kansas population 13,000. Uh, I was there last year and the economist, one of the economists there pointed out that this little town had 63 gas stations uh, and it was, they were literally littering the, the face of the town and, and he said that in no sane society would a community that size have 63 different gas stations, but what we had was a massive war between the big gasoline producers to try to take over the Kansas Territory. And we had, before the Vietnam War changed our economic environment, a considerable concern and anxiety about the possibility of unemployment becoming serious. A year ago, there was serious discussion that by this year, unemployment would be up around 7%. And this was based on, first of all, the uh, fact that more and more women were entering the labor force. Second, that automation was eliminating 2 million jobs a year. And it's still to be decided whether 
more jobs, enough jobs are created by the changed economic environment to make up for this. The Secretary of Labor, Mr. Wirtz, is not convinced. For example, he says that machines are not producing as many jobs as they are currently eliminating. And we were also concerned about the fact that a, there might be a great flood of 18 and 19 year old people entering the labor force. This didn't work out first because of the draft and second because many people were going into the job corps and also because a great many people are going to college. So that, for example, of the teenage males today, only 43% are on the labor force, whereas back in 1947, 54% were on the labor force. But under the pressures that have been building up in recent years and before the Vietnam War became a major economic force in our way of life, we were seeing a great deal of concern about ways to generate economic activity and economic growth. And we have, as you know, gotten into a new economics where the purpose is to keep purchasing power growing at any cost. Both business and government are seeking to stimulate economic activity any kind so long as it creates sales and jobs and taxes. And the government itself got into the participation in this by accepting the fact that it had a role in what is called demand management, keeping us in a mood to demand more and more goods. And it does this by, one, by pumping more and more money into the economy. It does it also by manipulating the supply of money wherever it can uh, to make uh, credit easily available. And this is why Mr. Johnson became so upset with Mr. Martin of the Federal Reserve Board who made this more difficult. And also, we are seeing efforts to cut taxes and we're even hearing discussions that deficit spending is good now and there's even talk about when we have uh, the government gets more money than expect, that expects that instead of reducing the federal government debt, it should turn the money over to the states and let the states pump it into the economy. One result of all this is that we're seeing a great just drop in the assumption that there is a necessary cat and dog relationship between government and business. I think we're seeing instead a growing understanding that government and business need to cooperate to handle many of the new kinds of problems that are arising today. But as a result of the kind of situation I just described about the problems arising from our productivity, one of the other great changes we're seeing is a continual pressure on us to get our consumption up to ever higher levels. And the government is cooperating, as I've indicated, and so is industry. And although consumption of goods and services right now is at an all-time high, no one seems to be satisfied. The Wall Street Journal has complained about the backwardness of the American consumers. The vice president of Chase National Bank has stated that for the last six years, our economy has been sluggish. And industry has been doing a great deal to keep us spending and buying. As for example, more and more our new kind of communities are centered around shopping centers rather than around the old kind of inst institutions of the city hall and the church and the county or the, the, the green. And we're seeing an enormous increase in the amount of sales messages aimed at the public. We have today 6% of the world's population, but we have 60% of the world's advertising messages beamed at us. And the average American family in the course of a single day is subjected to about 1,500 and 16 messages. And there is a predic prediction that within a decade, the amount of sales messages aimed at us will be at least twice as much as it is today, because as you get more and more into selling people things that they don't necessarily need, it takes more huffing and puffing, uh, and there's more uh, blacking out because of difficulty in reaching our attention, so that the cost of advertising per unit of anything sold is going up at a quite a 
remarkable rate. And there's also a great fascination with finding new ways to get our attention, hold our attention by the use of psychological appeals, playing upon our hidden needs, our hidden anxieties. Even the casket people have been exploring what they call the depth approach to the consumer. Uh, <coughs> they have an urgent need, apparently, to pre-sell their, their products um, because people don't like to think about it beforehand. We're seeing a great fascination with exploiting status anxieties in order to sell goods. We're seeing a great effort being made to keep us in a, an impulsive mood. Millions of dollars are going into what they call impulse research, how to make us behave more foolishly or more impulsively when we get into the stores. And we're urged to throw things away. U.S. Steel has spent a million dollars to persuade us that our beds are too small. And Sales Management Magazine summed up the whole trend by saying <coughs> that tomorrow more than ever, our lives will be disposable. We're seeing a great fascination with exploiting holidays as occasions for big time splurging. Halloween last year finally went over the $100 million mark in terms of sales that were generated for horror masks and things like that. And also we have, of course, Christmas, which was we've just recovered from a, an $8 billion binge. I heard on the radio, uh, a Long Island radio, this message. Do you want your children to love you? This was last December. If you do, pile the packages under the Christmas tree, borrow the money from home finance company to do so. Uh, solve the whole problem. We are, <coughs> American consumers are going into installment debt 33% faster today than they are repaying their installment debts. And I don't think that can continue indefinitely. We're seeing a great exploitation of narcissism, self-love, self-admiration. And there's triumphant reports in the trade journals of advertising, for example, that whereas back in the bad old days of 1947, only two out of 10 girls wore mascara as a common ordinary thing, now nine out of 10 do. This is progress. And we're seeing the promotion of an itch for newness, persuading us that we have to keep changing whatever we have. Uh, and this even spills over into wives. I gather here in California, you change your wives every seven years. Uh, a marriage counselor was explaining that uh, this could be attributed to the fact that people in California have a short interest span. Uh, <coughs> but at any rate, we do have this exploitation of an itch for newness. Lady Clarol adds, the lady is saying it just switched to bewitch. She, she boasts of the fact, she says, if I have only one life to live, I want to live as, as a Clairol blonde. And we're seeing a great fascination with the youth market. Young people advertise that just last week, I read that a new advertising agency, a big new advertising agency has been set up that will deal entirely with youth. The youth market fascinates marketers not only because they have so much money and there are so many youths, but also because they are at the stage of forming lifetime buying habits. So the, the great cry is to get them at the get age and also to get them to want the products at ever younger ages. If you do, well, you can sell more of them. And the most obvious case of point of success in this area has been the success of the Brazier industry. There are literally tens of thousands of nine and ten-year-old girls wearing brassieres these days. They call them training bras. Uh, this, I think, <coughs> this achievement, I think, is one of the more remarkable successes of the marketing industry. And we can expect for the future the unveiling of many new techniques and strategies for making us 
more free in our spending and more s vulnerable to advertising. The advertising age just reported here a couple of weeks ago a forecast that within nine years they will have perfected computers to the point that they can put into the computers information about what they call power words that are known to have a powerful impact on specific segments of our consuming population, either in terms of age or income or ethnic background and so on. And they boasted and said that they'll be able to select a message as a result of this that will almost subliminally mesmerize the unpersuaded consumers. That was their words, not mine. But simply using persuasion, I think, is not enough to cope with all of our productivity, and there's a search for new outlets. And that brings me to some of the other trends that we're seeing in terms of keeping our economy humming, and all of these are having an effect upon changing our way of life. We're seeing a not only an enormous growth of our population in the United States, but a growing fascination with the economic dividends that can come from this explosion of growth. In the time it took me to stagger through that sentence, we'd added another person to our population. We are adding, as I don't need to tell you in California, we're adding three million people a year to our population. And within the coming decade, we will be adding to our population in America the equivalent of all the people in the western half of the country, which is somewhere starting at the east of Missouri. And all of this, I think, to some extent, springs from the fact that people have more money and they're getting married earlier and marketers are glorifying the idea that, that having lots of babies uh, and, and, and is, is great for America and is proof of old-fashioned virility. More girls are having their first baby at the age of 19 than any other year now. And we're having now tens of thousands of 38-year-old grandmothers across the countryside uh, wearing slacks and, and uh, uh, still have uh, at least half of their lifetime ahead of them. And this is partly also due to medical advances. But there is a growing reliance upon all this population to solve disagreeable problems. The automobile industry has been busy patting itself on the back for the last three years about the fact that they've pushed automobile sales up from four and a half million to about nine million, but it could have been readily predictable because of the fantastic surge of people coming into the 16 to 18 year old level, all wanting cars and putting pressure on the old man to get one for them. And very little thought is going into what all of these increases in population are doing to our style of life. We are going to have another 150 million people in this country in the next 22 or 23 years, and they are seen primarily as 150, well, 126 or 27 years, excuse me. And they are primarily seen as 150 million happy consumers and taxpayers but I would suggest that they also raised serious questions in terms of strain on our recreational facilities and resources and living space, uh, pollution, and so on. We're also seeing, as another major change, I think, a growing reliance in our land upon military and space spending. I think we have become a militaristic society without being the least bit militaristic as a people. And certainly we've had for the last 20 years alternating hot and cold wars. And there's no, I am not here to argue the, the wisdom of these, the need for defense, but I am here to point out the discoveries that are being made about some of the remarkable economic consequences of a high, a high level of spending for defense and for space. For example, we have the fact that the Wall Street Journal reports that six out of every ten engineers in the country now are working in some jobs that are directly or indirectly related to the defense program. 
and we had evidence last week of the impact of defense when and government buying when the president was trying to discourage the steel companies from raising their prices and saying that the government wouldn't buy steel from those companies that structural steel and it turned out that a quarter of all the structural steel sold in the United States today is sold to one of three government agencies, the Pentagon or the Commerce Department or the General Services Administration that builds federal buildings around the country. And I think we are seeing a, a rather dangerous fascination with the impact of military spending. During the Cuban crisis, the Herald Tribune had this headline, the Cuban crisis seen as boon to the economy. Uh, a month later, Mr. Khrushchev decided to pull his missiles out of Cuba, and the headline was, easing crisis dims outlook for business. More recently, the New York Times reported Vietnam proving boon to industry. The Wall Street Journal said that increasing military outlays are providing unexpected extra business to a wide range of companies. In addition, of course, to raising draft calls and taking more young men out of the civilian labor market. Both apparently happy results. Uh, and here again, the, uh, the Wall Street Journal, ev almost every day they have a story reporting excitement about the money that's becoming available. Extra zip for the economy from the Vietnam buildup. Uh, additional billions will be funneled into the pocketbooks of many parts of the land. But then they get worried sometimes, as for example, it says that the uncertainty is that if the fighting there escalates too sharply, uh, there's a possibility that government may, may clamp down controls on business. They don't want that, of course. But we do have the fact that defense and space have become uh, enormously important to the prosperity of many areas of our land and particularly in the southern half of California. And we have other states quite angry because they aren't, aren't getting their peace, they aren't getting their share. New York is furious at California because it's only getting half as much of the defense business as California is. And we have more seriously, I think, also the disturbing fact that in two-thirds of all the congressional districts in this land, there are major military installations, and in practically every congressional district, there is a major defense plant, so that obviously when you have any cutbacks, you have hollering across the land. And some of these, as we get to the point where obviously we have enough munitions to, already we have enough munitions to the equivalent of 10 tons of TNT for every man, woman, and child on this planet. Uh, but at some point, we are going to be slowing down, and there's been talk of that already, and so more and more the thought is going to spending for space because you can shoot great quantities of economic activity into space. There are good scientific reasons for all the space exploration. There are good reasons for romance for the exploration. There are good reasons for uh, competing with Russia. Russia claims it doesn't care anymore. But at any rate, there are economic aspects of this, as was stated by the New York Times in pointing out that 20 different states, 26 different states have a piece of the moon business. And it said that twen the Mr. Webb, the space administrator, has been having difficulty getting enough money, or what he thinks is enough money. And it's, it quoted him as saying, when the going gets rough on Capitol Hill, Mr. James Webb likes to point out that all those 20 billions of dollars for going to the moon will be spent in congressional districts here on Earth. And I think we're also seeing a great, as a part of changes taking place, a growing fascination with knowing more about the outside world, trading more with the outside world. I think we are becoming more world-minded politically, much more sophisticated when, than we were 10 years ago. We're seeing also a great growth in giant organizations to 
cope with all these changes. You see fantastic situations such as I read this headline in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, big tractors contributing to the creation of large farms. I thought it was the other way around, but it goes on to say that the Department of Agriculture study shows how bigger and better farm tractors are playing a major role in forcing some farmers out of business and encouraging the creation of larger farms. Certainly we're going to be thinking more and more in the future about coping with giant organizations and these oligarchies of four, three or four countries companies that control entire industries. In the future, I think we're going to see a recognized, a growing recognition of the fact that while we are the most exciting country in the world, that we do have challenges that need to be faced, very serious challenges. I think we're going to, in the coming decades, I think you in the room are going to be giving a lot more thought than my generation is given to finding a reasonable balance between a more reasonable balance between our shrinking resources and our exploding population. I think we're going to see a, a need for, and you're going to recognize a need for greater consumer intelligence and skepticism in the face of all this mounting pressure that's being put on us to make us more foolish in our behavior. I think we're going to see a recognized need to devote more of our creative energy to facing the kinds of challenges we've neglected in the past because they require unified efforts such as coping with the sleaziness of our cities and the pollution and bringing water from Alaska or bringing it from the ocean and things like that. And I think we're going to see a need to start preparing for the economic jolt of a really significant redu reduction in military spending if peace does become a, a reality for the globe. I think you're going to see a recognized need to shed the cliches that there's somehow a natural en enmity between government and business because increasingly we will be seeing a society calling for the achievement of objectives that will require close cooperation between government and industry. And I think we're going to see a need to break the connection between prosperity and full employment. But at the same time, I think we're going to do, have to do this in a way that will give people a sense of making a creative contribution to our society and not just sitting and, and collecting their, their pay. And finally, I think we're going to see a need for a search for values that are realistic in terms of the conditions of life as they exist today and still will give the individual a sense of personal fulfillment and dignity. It's being said that some of the puritanical virtues that made industrialization possible are no longer functional. For example, the willingness to wait for long-term rewards. In our new consumeristic society, instant gratification is being glorified, hedonism, narcissism, and even promiscuity as a part of living for the moment are being is being glorified as good, clean fun made possible by the scientific advances in safety devices. But I would raise the question whether all this self-absorption and this living for the moment will sustain an enduring style of life. I believe we do need to re-examine our value systems very deeply in coming years and encourage all of our citizens to develop deeply felt personal standards about what they consider to be ideals for their personal behavior. Thank you very much.